Hey, thanks very much. Yeah, and um, just to that, um, so I, um, I work in a center um, that's called the Center for Spatial, Advanced Spatial Analysis, and we do a lot of urban modeling um, and look at cities primarily uh, quantitatively, and that center is embedded in the faculty of um, the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment. Uh, the, uh, the planning school um, architecture um, um, are part of that um, faculty. Um, and that is my, my wider disciplinary uh, context. So in fact, some of the work that I'm referring to goes back to the work that I did at LSE Cities, where I was working much more on um, travel demand and interactions between travel demand and um, the built environment. So I will share my screen now. Um, and I hope you can see the slides share. Can you see them? Yes, yes. Right, okay, thanks very much. And um, so the um, video was very good introducing the wider context. Uh, thank, thanks very much for that. We're not going to talk about Lefebvre. Um, and if you've read Lefebvre, you might be relieved now <laughs> um, because it is um, a, a very difficult text. Um, but what um, um, I thought uh, might be useful um, as well um, to focus on is really the question about morphology um, and um, how it links to um, urbanization, um, but also to within that discussion um, to um, think about um, urban form. Just give me a second, please. Ah, okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, to look at urban form um, and look at what are current um, visions of urban form, what kinds of urban forms are held to be sustainable, um, and, um, and look at some of the technical aspects of urban form in this, in this uh, lecture. Um, we will then um, discuss briefly how urban form might be related to energy demand. I'm sure that relates to some of the points that have already been covered in the summer school. Um, and um, then to the important questions of defining cities and why that matters and how that matters. Um, and then we will uh, focus on the wider context of global urbanization, how that might link to morphology. Um, so these are the three um, um, topics and the reading list was already mentioned, um, really focuses on um, the conceptual literature around it. Whereas in the slide, in the presentation, as you will see, you will find a number of links that link to um, the um, um, technical um, dimension of it, and that's all openly available, publicly available, um, and you know, complements perhaps the more conceptual focus um, of the reading list. Okay, so let me just start with the um, first topic, um, where I'd like to look at what are, what's current thinking about. Um, travel demand um, and urban form. Now, can you still hear me? Cool. Sorry about that. Um, so we have, so basically both, both cities, Atlanta and Barcelona, they um, um, have a population of 5 million people. And you can see that the urban form is of course very different. Um, and um, so 5 million people, um, but also, um, um, and if you go down to, um, to look at those, at these figures, um, you, you can see that uh, carbon emissions from transport um, um, are very different. So 10 times larger in Atlanta than there are in Barcelona. Um, and um, carbon emissions, um, of course, correlate very much with energy demand. So this is really um, some, you know, an important vision of urban form, compact urban form versus dispersed urban form, and the different experience and the different activities um, that these urban forms condition and um, that lead to very different level of energy demands, as I said, urban experience, but also um, and travel demand um, and various other um, other ways that are relevant to energy. We will look at that in a moment. Um, so in uh, the 1990s, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, we can, um, there has been a very influential uh, study um, in, 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 published in 89 um, by New, Kenworth and Newman. Um, and um, they have looked at um, different um, levels of urban density across the globe and um, looked at aggregate um, um, energy demand, sorry, per capita energy demand um, per year. 
Um, and they found this relationship. Um, so that, in fact, you can see Atlanta up there um, at the top. Um, and Barcelona somewhere at the bottom in the, um, at the 200 persons per hectare. Um, and you can see how um, uh, they locate on the spectrum of cities. Um, um, they can be uh, mapped between urban density and per capita uh, energy use. And this has been very influential and inspired a whole range of different studies um, that looked at the, um, the relationship between urban, urban form and travel demand. Um, and there has been quite a huge discussion about yeah, how important is urban form given other factors that were already mentioned in the video, um, um, such as um, gender, cultural influences, social class, and so forth, um, and, um, uh, and income, and, and, and so on. So um, this is very much um, a vision of, um, of urban form. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and it's very much. Um, um, sparked a discussion also in, in planning, but in, in travel demand research in particular on what um, kind of urban form um, allows sustainable forms of mobility with reduced energy uh, use and connected um, emissions. And of course, that is very much um, um, urban sprawl is very much seen um, as an urban form that is problematic. This is in Atlanta, this is Phoenix, um, and you can see um, urban, the characteristics of urban sprawl, um, very much dependent on the automobile um, and a low density detached housing and so forth. So the discussion then, next slide please, um, is um, um, focused then on what kind of urban form um, is, can we deem more sustainable. And here we can see Barcelona. Um, and um, what we can see here is a more compact um, 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 urban form. Um, and um, particularly in Barcelona, um, famously, um, the, the grid pattern um, that is dominated by peri-compact perimeter urban blocks um, in which um, there are um, urban blocks of residences, fairly high density, multifamily um, um, apartment blocks, um, um, often with um, 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 commercial activities um, in the on the ground floor, um, uh, an inner courtyard for for leisure for for residents, um, and um, a fairly walkable um, environment with a lot of permeability, a lot of connectivity, uh, where people can walk around and can um, you know reach destinations um, quite easily. Blocks aren't too large, and so forth. In um, image B, you can see uh, another uh, model of um, sustainable urban form, um, which um, is um, the, um, uh, based on the idea of densification um, at a particular point, um, usually a transport hub, a metro line, for example, and that is the idea of transit-oriented development, um, where existing low-density environments can be densified around the transit hub, hub and within um, or close to the transit hub, um, there can be more activities. Um, they're not just residences, but also commercial activity and so forth. And um, image C shows um, another uh, aspect, which is about walkability, high quality urban environments um, that encourage people to walk and um, um, choose uh, modes of active travel. And there are some at the bottom, I've listed some of the influential planning paradigms um, that are very much based on these ideas to different, they emphasize different elements of those, but they essentially come down to, to three dimensions, density, population density, um, um, diversity, um, diversity of activities, commercial, residential, and design. So good sustainable neighborhoods in that sense should be reasonably dense, um, they should be diverse in terms of activities and practices, uh, so activities um, and uh, land use, um, and um, they also should be well designed and should, uh, by design, encourage um, walking and allow, allow walking um, and other forms of um, active travel. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so let us go through them very quickly, and um, I thought it might be useful just to list how they can be measured, um, um, either for planning or for the analysis of the built environment. Um, and looking at the um, drawing um, at the top, we see um, a particular 
um, um, square, let's I think let it be 500 by 500 meters, um, and you have a given population um, that you'd like to accommodate in that square as a planner, imagine you're a planner, um, and um, so you need to achieve a particular kind of density. Now all of those um, typologies that are shown accommodate the same number of people. So um, you can achieve, within certain limits, you can achieve a particular kind of density um, that um, with different typologies. It doesn't tell you exactly what kind of um, typology, building typology and design um, a given level of density um, requires. Um, so um, what you can see here is basically the idea of density um, and, and there are two dimensions to it. One relates to activities. These are related to residential density or employment density measured as jobs per square, square kilometer, people per square kilometer. I think planners tend to use in terms of dwelling and commercial units per square kilometer or hectare. A hectare is, is, is roughly the size of a football field. Um, and, um, and the second dimension relates to build form. So how intensely built up is my area um, and while um, population and employment density possibly is kept constant in the image above what varies are those different facts of, um, of built form floor area ratio is a very common um, indicator that looks at all the gross floor area on all levels and uh, relates it to um, the plot size um, coverage ratio is related um, and um, then there's building and surface to volume ratio, highly specific, perhaps actually not that used that much, but uh, what is important um, um, in planning um, is um, as well the number of um, stories, which is often a constraint um, in planning as well. Next. Uh, then we come to diversity, and diversity also illustrated here. And by the way, at the bottom, you see um, um, links. Um, that um, um, look at case studies and applications um, and look at, you know, diverse, you know, I think here's the design guide, I can't see the, uh, the image fully, um, but I think there's a design guide by the New Zealand government um, that's linked to here and it's quite useful to look at what's the discussion, what's an application of diversity and, and also how it's been measured in design. Um, and diversity is really about the mixing um, of land users and different activities at different scales. So we can think about mixing at the neighborhood scale, where do we locate commercial activities vis-a-vis -vis residential activities, but also within individual blocks, as you can see in the middle, um, but also within buildings, ground floor, um, commercial spaces and residential spaces up and in higher uh, stories higher up. Um, um, so different kind of granularities and scales of mixing, um, which really diversity um, is, is about. And um, measures um, um, can be categorized into accessibility-based measures, um, where you look at simple proportions within a given area, how many are residential, how many are retail, and so forth, uh, mixed-use building, but also um, accessibility measures that take into account the uh, uh, transport network, the street network in particular, that look at walking distance and some more sophisticated um, 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 indicators, look at the dynamic, dynamic measures um, that even take into account public transport schedules, for example, travel time um, by different modes um, and uh, time varying dynamic measures of accessibility. Then you've got distribu distribution of focused measures, uh, which usually come as a sort of a fancy ratio, um, land use dissimilarity and entropy um, of land use balance, um, which look at you know, the distribution and the relative balance of these different uh, land use. And I think the links at the bottom should give you, you know, a good idea of, of, of what these are. Next, please. Um, and then we've got design. And design um, relates mainly to um, the street network, how it is laid out, um, and, and this relates to questions of connectivity, but also how public space is designed. Is it walkable? Is it um, pleasant to walk around? And what are the different factors that affect our experience uh, while we are in public space? Um, and the connectivity-based measures, um, here the idea is um, that you know the, the image on the left, the grid network is more permeable, it's easier to get to a destination, 
um, different um, trips can be distributed more easily across different environments and it allows more flexibility in terms of uh, land use mix as well. So it's related um, to that dimension as well. Whereas the image, um, the street network in the, in the middle right um, shows a classic suburban street network, which is related to Cure de Sac um, and where, um, or, so Cure de Sac structures um, 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 where uh, they're basically dead ends and if you were to walk from a to b you would possibly have to like in the labyrinth uh, walk around many corners to get you know to to a place that is nearby really and therefore discourages walking and encourages very much um, car use instead um, in terms of uh, public space quality um, there is a lot of work in walkability there are different frameworks of measuring walkability and um, more recently there has been a framework that's become particularly influential now um, around the globe which is um, the healthy streets um, approach um, which sets out particular indicators that are particular uh, um, particularly important um, to you know the quality of public space and the quality of streets um, and the encouragement of active travel Next, please. Right, so, and so these are um, important ingredients of sustainable urban form, density, diversity, and design. Um, and they combine in different forms, and they have always combined in different forms, also historically. Um, and this is an image that shows, you know, the average city, perhaps, at least in the global north, um, um, where you have a dense center or that might be characterized as the walking city. So people who live in the center are able and often do walk to work, for example. Um, and these were the often historic city centers. Then when uh, new transport modes emerge, particular uh, the tram, uh, tram, uh, trams during uh, industrialization in, in Europe and North America, um, um, then those city centers could be extended and people could uh, commute and get around using those new modes, tram uh, networks. Um, and these could be characterized as tram um, suburbs historically. And there's the automobile city then that could emerge when um, cars become, uh, became available, were mass produced. And these are the classic suburban sprawling areas. And then there were interventions later on. Um, and um, which could be characterized as the transit city, um, which very much are based on the idea of, you know, transit-oriented development, so densification around um, different transport hubs. The next one. So, and those different forms relate to energy in, in many different ways. Um, so one is, as I've already indicated very much, um, travel demand. Um, and here, what we can see is the model split um, of um, all trips, I believe, um, in Atlanta um, uh, compared to Barcelona. What you can see is that 93% of all trips are made by the private car, whereas um, in Barcelona, it is the same share as 29%. Uh, 42% um, in Barcelona walk compared to only 1% in um, of all trips are made by walking on foot compared to 1% of trips in Atlanta. And um, also, uh, you know, a, a significant difference between the use of public transit. So one of the um, um, impacts of urban form on travel is, of course, mode choice. Um, as um, urban form is more compact, more active travel is possible. And here's just a reminder the two, to the two urban uh, footprints um, being shown below as well. Um, mode choice is also um, affected by, of course, other factors. And um, perhaps, yeah, if we can go to the next slide, can um, say more about this. So um, here, this is my, my own study. Um, what characterizes this literature is um, that most of it is done in the global north with its historical specificity. Uh, remember the average city, the walking city, tram suburbs, and automobile city. Um, but also, um, it is often based on case studies, single case studies, um, and those studies investigated do denser neighborhoods enable more active travel um, or reduced uh, travel demand. Very little has been done in the global south, and this is a study that looked at um, um, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, and Istanbul, uh, Istanbul and um, compared them using exactly the same research design replicated in 
um, those three cities. Um, I did that um, as part of a uh, project at LSE Cities um, and at Lund School of Economics. Um, and um, what you can see here is different kind of on the left in the in the diagrams you can see um, a, a different kinds of morphologies across Sao Paulo, Mumbai and Istanbul. So um, the x-axis shows you um, different density levels um, and within these different density levels how many people um, uh, live um, within these different density levels. And what you can see in Sao Paulo for example um, is um, that up to well, the vast majority of people live in density levels up to 20,000 um, um, people per square kilometer, whereas in Mumbai, it's stretched out much further. The majority of the people actually lives above 20,000 people per square kilometer. So very different kind of urban densities. These are net densities, um, uh, population densities, and they relate to accessibility um, shown on the um, and the um, second uh, diagram um, where you look at the population distribution in relation to um, the mass rapid transit system. Um, and um, in Istanbul, which is highlighted in red, 37% of the population live within one kilometer of the mass rapid transit system, whereas in, in Mumbai, it's 55%. So these are, and Mumbai hasn't got a um, perhaps a network that's necessarily as dense or as extensive as the city like Sao Paulo, for example. So that is an, uh, an indication of, you know, differences between urban form and accessibility, which will then be reflected in different levels of travel demand and potential for reduced travel. What happens often in those studies um, is that um, people look at elasticities, so that is the question of have holding everything else constant, so social status of people, gender, and so forth, um, how much does the environment here represented as density, diversity, and design um, influence uh, travel time? Um, and um, so that's a very common approach in measuring the impact of the built environment. Um, what is interesting in those three cities is the different cultural um, influences. So in Mumbai, for example, gender is uh, the driving, um, well, um, the ma a major determinant of mode choice, um, and in Sao Paulo it is something like social class. And um, the built environment is much more influential when it comes to the trip length. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, but a kiwi. <laughs> okay, someone has. Uh, yeah, I don't have a small one. Can uh, we yeah. the next slide, please? Twenty-two walk through something. Mm. Through my so um, that was travel demand, um, and, um, but there are also other um, sources of energy demand. Um, and see, this is a study uh, that looked at um, raw materials um, and um, when neighborhoods are constructed and demolished, which isn't looked at very much. Um, and um, what um, you can see, so you've got the typology again of automobile urban fabric, transit urban fabric, and walking urban fabric. And when you build neighborhoods that you know, would fall into these classes, uh, typological classes, um, very different uh, amounts of raw materials are needed. Um, and um, that is, of course, if you think about um, um, you know, the urban, uh, automobile urban fabrics of the sprawling suburbs, you need more concrete in, um, to um, build roads. Roads need to be longer. They need to be potentially wider. They you need to build driveways. Um, you've got fully detached housing to accommodate one dwelling unit. Um, and um, so that um, requires significantly more raw materials in building and also in demolition at the end um, than, um, or more energy use in demolition um, than um, for other typologies. So that is another source um, of raw materials. And um, that, of course, heavily relinks to questions of greenhouse gas emissions. Construction has a huge impact on energy demand and greenhouse gas emission, but it isn't looked at very much in the context of cities. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. Next, please. And then a, a, a third um, 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 angle is heat energy demand. And this is a study conducted by Alice's Cities, which um, they run when I joined uh, Alice's Cities in 2009, 2010. 
um, and um, they um, looked at different typologies, which are shown. Some of them are shown uh, here um, on the in, on the right side, uh, right hand side. Um, and they've got different characteristics in terms of density, diversity, and design. And they found that there is some um, a relationship between um, heat energy demand and the thermal performance of individual dwelling, dwelling units um, and urban morphology, um, and um, which relates to the um, relationship between input um, of um, solar radiation and um, passive thermal gain and thermal loss. So usually in detached um, housing areas, um, um, normally um, uh, thermal gain from solar radiation is higher, but also your loss is higher. And it's really about that kind of balance that then um, has an impact on your thermal performance, holding things like insulation and so forth uh, constant. Uh, this study is really worth reading. There's a paper in the in open access report. Um, and uh, really a very careful analysis about building about neighborhood typologies, um, building related measures and energy heat energy demand. Next please. So um, so that is really the um, context um, uh, or, or some links between urban morphology um, and energy demand. Um, but one important message um, that I also want to include is that we shouldn't look at urban uh, form in isolation. Urban form is very much related to other characteristics, um, and in particular the, um, you know, the social environment, of course. And what we often find in this um, current economic phase is that when um, cities um, are densified, transit-oriented development um, projects or schemes are developed, and uh, what you can see is that it is coupled with, it's often developer-led. Um, you can see an in rise in, of course, the quality of public space, but also a rise of house prices and gentrification, which then tends to displace people who tended to live in those lower, lower walkable, lower quality environments to um, areas further outside the city, which again increases their travel. So I think the term complexity was mentioned at the beginning. Um, and um, it is really important to remember that there are, through built environment interventions, there are always unintended consequences um, that might occur in other areas of application, such as you know, the social environment of cities um, and, um, and perhaps economic development as well, uh, that bear on these sustainability goals um, of social ju justice, economic prosperity, and environmental protection. And really the um, triangle here, which um, can, has been called the planner's triangle, um, is a really useful device to think through those inter relationships, those interdependencies, and identify some of these conflicts. Um, and in fact, um, here the, the point is um, that what often happens in urban policy is that, okay, we need to, we need a sustainability, sustainable cities policy. Uh, we've got these three very well-known dimensions and within those dimensions we define objectives and so forth without really focusing on the idea that some of those goals can actually be conflicting um, they are kind of juxtaposed alongside and we are trying our best to achieve those goals and hope then to achieve a balance in sustainability terms but here the point of campbell is no actually we need to focus much more on the conflicts themselves and make them center stage to you know policy to planning and policy and I think the same can be said um, about, you know, sustainable urban form, developing sustainable urban form. Next, please. So that brings me to defining city. And I am conscious of time. Sorry about the technical issues earlier. Um, so I will be, I'll try to be quick. Um, I hope it's okay we run maybe five minutes over. Um, so let's uh, come to the next important point of defining cities. And um, so here I'd like to, um, start with different notions of cities and how they relate to different spatialities that we imagine. And then I will explain why this is important for urban form. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure you have seen, you've heard a lot about cities already and you've seen different videos, um, but one notion of city that is quite common, particular in the, um, in perhaps in the economics focused literature and consultancy and also um, in, in, in practice, 
is um, cities are agents. So cities um, are agents, they have certain characteristics. Um, these characteristics can be measured. Um, you know, sustainability league tables, perhaps, um, are very, um, a very good example of that. Cities can be ranked. Um, and, you know, here's an example at the top. You can see Oslo isn't doing as well as London on this particular um, benchmarking um, um, framework. Um, so the idea being, what can Oslo learn from London? And therefore, you know, if, if those can be identified, those measures, um, Oslo should implement them. And this is very much a notion that cities are free agents. They are driving the transformation. Um, urbanization is the solution. Um, cities are part of the solution of, you know, the transformation that is needed to um, 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 tackle climate change uh, and so forth. Um, and it is really, that's where really the agency um, uh, and the programs uh, need to be defined and happen. Um, and uh, what the, this vision doesn't really look at is the hinterland and how cities themselves are actually embedded spatially within their wider environment and how the wider environment, the region, um, has an impact on cities but also within governance frameworks. Are we talking about a federal system like in the United States, where cities tend to have more agency or highly centralized systems such as in the UK, where many cities don't even have mayors. So there is a question around how agent, or how much agency can be attributed to cities. Um, but a very prominent notion is cities as these free agents that are driving the transformation. And the second, um, you know, I think can we go back briefly to the uh, second? So the second vision is cities as containers where um, you very much look at what is happening within your city. So for example, if you want to make London more sustainable, um, you would want to work on London's urban form. Um, this is an image um, that shows household uh, without um, vehicles, number of households without vehicles. And you know, you may now think about interventions that increase that ratio and you know increase um, households without the proportion of households without vehicles in the outskirts and think about transit oriented development, densification and so forth. Now it has also been shown then that um, in a context in a highly dynamic um, housing market as in London that this leads to uh, gentrification it, as I've already mentioned it leads to potentially displacement but it also um, um, leads to households who prefer car travel potentially um, to move to locations outside London. So this is really the idea. So cities, a second um, vision of cities is often cities as these, um, you know, internally structured containers, a kind of cookie cut out of the wider environment. Um, and, um, but and without really um, looking at what's happening, how is the environment outside London, in this case, outside the city, affecting what's going on in the city. So one example could be displacement of car-loving individuals and household to more car-friendly um, areas outside the city, which again increases commuting, um, um, but also uh, the um, activities um, around London and how that affects, you know, for example, commuting relations and related uh, energy demand. Um, um, will have, you know, will limit London's ability to address energy demand and sustainability through urban form interventions within its administrative um, boundary. So here, um, very much the idea um, that cities are embedded within a wider environment, and that brings me to the third perspective, which is really uh, what we need to think about, cities as open systems. So whatever London is doing in its centre will have an impact on its wide environment and vice, uh, vice versa. So London if, uh, is a very you know, centralized city um, with a high concentration of workplaces and, and residents. And of course it attracts, um, well, not so much residents, but in particular workplaces. And to give you an example, in the center of London, um, you've got employment densities of approximately 10 to 20 times higher than residential uh, density in, in areas such as in the city of London, the financial district. And that attracts, of course, a lot of commuters. London is very expensive. 
Um, and so here it generates demand for travel within London boundaries, but also outside London boundaries. And the question is simply when we think about the energy performance or energy demand of cities, that travel demand that is generated outside the boundaries of London, should that be attributed to London or should that be attributed to the municipality in which those people live? And this is something that isn't often been thought about very much, but the question of where is energy demand produced, um, where um, is um, where it is generated, induced, um, and where is it uh, used in the end? What's the end use? Where does the end use occur? Next, please. So I skipped this. Our center does a lot of work on defining cities and looks at how that relates to different indicators. Can, next, please. Um, uh, so here's again the picture. Um, 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 and you can see, so to think about defining cities perhaps, one way, a typical way of defining cities to look at urban density in relation to travel to work, commuter relations, um, and um, you can see the boundary of London. If we remove that boundary, it wasn't actually quite easy um, to decide how to define London. So the, the point being, uh, cities as open systems, it is actually very difficult to define cities. Um, and um, it can be done in, in many different ways. Next, please. So in terms of energy demand, um, there has been a recent um, 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 study of the C40 um, group um, that um, looked at um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And let's accept that greenhouse gas emissions, of course, correlate with energy demand a lot. Um, and so the discussion that I've just outlined um, here is um, appears in uh, the uh, discussion around production versus consumption perspectives of um, um, greenhouse gas emissions. Has this already been covered in the summer school? Is it something new? No, okay. So, so, and this is where really the boundary of cities becomes really crucial. So the traditional way of measuring greenhouse gas emissions is what's been called the sector-based greenhouse gas emissions. You look at your city, London, with your administrative boundary, you look at travel demand, you look at various different activities, what's being produced in London, and then you measure the greenhouse gas emissions at source, and you can extend that to energy demand. Another perspective, though, is to look at, well, what is actually happening outside um, the boundaries of London? So everything that is consumed within London, where is that produced? Okay, so we, for example, might consume a high number of goods, consumer goods in London, these are being produced all over the globe. Um, shouldn't we actually think about energy uh, demand in terms of consumption and end use, um, where um, London, in fact, consumes a lot of um, or induces a lot of demand for production elsewhere, which then leads to greenhouse gas emissions? Um, elsewhere, but were very much linked to very much linked to activities in London. So this is again the importance of boundaries and how do we measure, how do we think about energy efficiency, perhaps of urban form, of cities performance, um, and about agency, how able are cities actually to lead any transformations that are important to um, the current uh, debates of climate change and so forth. Okay, where do we um, locate this. Um, and um, so that is a, a, an interesting study, um, and next slide, which I very much recommend. It's very difficult to measure, it's quite easy, well, fairly straightforward to measure um, um, greenhouse gas emissions at source, but then to look at where things are produced or consumed within city rests on an enormous amount of assumptions and to look at international data and so forth. It's very difficult to do, and there's much more work needed in that area. But what they find for the 79 cities for which they've done that estimation is if we use traditional measures of sector-based greenhouse gas emissions um, then, and compared to consumption-based um, measures, we find that some cities have a 1,000% increase um, of greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to the traditional measures. So a huge, a huge difference there. Um, and there is a number of cities um, that have higher greenhouse gas emissions that can be attributed to production rather than consumption. And these are the cities that tend to be in Asia and Africa. 
um, where you know, a lot of the um, consumer goods and uh, whatever is being consumed in the global north are being produced. So here a, a picture and I hope it shows how thinking about boundaries is very important in thinking about how cities can lead, for example, the energy transformation, particularly also as it relates to urban form. Next, please. So let me now spend two minutes, three minutes, um, on um, um, a, a point on urbanization. And this is really um, extending what I've just mentioned um, to, to the question of urbanization. And next, please. Um, so here we have already seen, so okay, London, let's take London as an example. Um, um, if we were to think about um, a more compact urban form, uh, concentrating activities in London, um, where um, are um, these, um, where, where activities, how are these activities sustained? How is a city like London um, sustained? Traditionally, there was a hinterland around city that supplied the, the, the goods and the, the commodities perhaps um, from its surrounding to be consumed in the city. Now this is all changed uh, based on technology. The hinterland is now global in that sense. So the previous um, world was based on what's often called bio or what's been called, can be called bioregionalism, where the city is really sustained through its immediate hinterland, which is just adjacent to, to the city itself. Now we have a global hinterland. Each city has its global hinterland, and this is very much required to sustain the activities that are going on in cities. And this is um, a key element of the idea of planetary urbanization, that in order to sustain cities at this vast scale, um, at um, the activities at this scale, um, a global hinterland is needed, and it leads to various transformations of you know, rural areas um, that are being restructured um, in order to supply an increasingly urban world. Okay, so that means that we cannot really ignore what's happening in rural areas when we talk about global urbanization, for example, and that very much relates to the question of energy demand again and the point about production versus consumption based um, emissions. Okay, so that is an important um, um, aspect. In the next slide. So that is in the paper. Um, um, if you read it, I think it will, and you think about what I've just told you, it will, it's a very accessible paper, but it will um, um, make, you know, a lot of sense, I think, um, and um, lead you to think about urbanization more globally. And another aspect is, of course, um, that cities, urbanization is strategically used for capital investment. So as we, you know, um, particularly now in the low interest rate environment, where do we put our money? And that is, of course, something that's asked at a large scale, global investors and so forth. And the built environment, urbanization is a huge, and very important dimension in which we can ensure return on investment to investment into the built environment and resale of properties and so forth. And just to give you a figure, in London in 2016, $6.6 billion were invested into the built environment for that purpose. And these 6.6 .6 billion just came out of Asia. So that is a huge influence on the built environment in London, um, on demand of different kinds of typology on London. And there is a question to which extent cities are actually able to manage that demand. Again, think here about cities as agents versus cities as open systems. Um, and we need to really think about urban form interventions within that broader context. Um, next, please. I'll skip this. Next, please. Um, so that's just what I've just said. Um, here to think through, when we think about um, morphology, we need to really broaden our perspective, not to just look at the neighborhood, but actually go up to the globe, go through all these different scales and look at the current drivers and forces of planetary urbanization to get a sense of what morphology can actually do, in what sense can it uh, mitigate energy demand, um, but how um, important this is given the backdrop of ongoing increasing urbanization with a lot of building activities. Um, and um, so that's the relationship and how that then relates to the idea of sustainable cities, but also the important dimension of territoriality 
and how are cities um, actually defined and how can we define them and in their many ways of doing that. Next slide, and that is the last slide. So what um, I would like to take away from this is, so sustainable urban form is deemed to be a very important area of intervention when it comes to mitigating energy demand in cities. Um, we've looked at compact urban form, which is particularly, which is deemed to be particularly uh, sustainable and uh, with its dimensions of density, diversity and design. Compact urban form, we've explored this briefly and loads of more lectures could be given on each of those uh, individuals, uh, individual dimensions. Uh, it leads to energy efficiency um, um, in terms of uh, travel in different sectors, travel, looked at raw materials and the emerging studies on that and heat energy demand. But important, we need to remember cities are open systems and they can be defined in many ways. And by the way of defining different diff visions, notions and definitions will have an impact on what we can say about city's ability to um, um, lead the energy transformation, for example, um, um, and, um, and you know, effectively intervene into, into urban, urban form. Um, and, um, and the last point is really planetary urbanization forms the big picture, which we need to also take into account um, when we think about you know, the effectiveness of morphology on mitigating energy demand um, against that wider, wider backdrop. Thanks very, very much. Um, I hope it wasn't too quick. And um, shall we, are there any questions? Do we have time for that? Or should we move that to the second session? Let's take a few questions. Okay, great. Sorry about that overrunning of the So is this new or has this already been covered in uh, the summer school so far? No, not with an emphasis on morphology. We've yeah, had okay. the C40 mm -hmm. report, for instance, says something taking a look at. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I wanted to challenge a bit this notion around compact urban form always being sustainable. Yeah. Because I think um, from my experience in, for example, the city of Cape Town, where the densest settlements are usually also the most vulnerable. So they're often overcrowded, um, very bad infrastructure. They're in areas of the city where um, that are prone to flooding and they often also have very poor um, public transport. Um, so I guess like in the global context that we have to be careful with just saying that compact urban form is always um, sustainable. Yeah, and I totally agree. Um, and um, a lot of these planning paradigms were developed in the global north um, with its you know, historical specificity. And there is in fact much more, there's a need for much more conceptual work in the global south um, or or at least I'm sure there is a lot, but it needs to be more prominent as well in, in the kind of discourse. Um, and um, I think you, you raised the important point that urban form shouldn't be looked at in isolation. It needs to be looked at with other factors in, in the social dimension, the economic dimension, if we want to use the um, sustainability framework. Um, and, um, and also, and I think that is in fact recognized um, uh, by, by planners and researchers, at a certain point, there are um, disbenefits of, um, of uh, urban form, of compactness. So if um, areas become too dense, um, then of course it leads to a lot of congestion um, and um, people tend to escape those areas and you know go on um, um, longer trips um, to fulfill their leisure needs for example um, and it has an opposite effect on on other areas of travel and can very much compensate any potential you know travel time savings for example um, in um, in those dense urban forms so that is absolutely, yeah, it's uh, very, very important um, that 
it has to be a, a certain balance and hyper dense environments can have a negative impact. There are different types of compact uh, city building as well. And you had that one slide where you showed um, where um, um, you had different, you, know, you had you had different sort of footprints uh, of, of buildings within an area, uh, and you had the same amount of people living in in these different yeah. uh, different buildings. I can't remember exactly, but um, so so I think that 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 that's a big part of the debate now. I guess kind of how um, yeah. I mean, most we ex most accept that the compact city building is the way to go. With this criticism that it's not always good, but how do we find kind of the the, the good ways of of, of building uh, compact cities? Or what what's how do we sort of uh, combine uh, compact urban forms with you know, green spaces and proper connections to public transportation and things like this that 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 make it actually actually work as 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 a city and as as, as an attractive city for for people. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, one, one thing I'd like to add, and it, it also links to the uh, previous question, um, compact cities should be viewed as a potential. So, you know, regardless of, so if we banned all cars tomorrow, um, then people in compact neighborhoods invariably uh, would be better off because, you know, trips are potentially shorter, distances are shorter, um, and it's easier um, to walk. Now, if we, so if we look at that in isolation, you know, we don't need to study that much. This is just um, very much, you know, we can't escape that conclusion. That's just the way it is. But um, when we start looking at the social dimension and then it becomes hugely more complex. And another um, issue, um, which is very uh, prominent, in particular in the travel demand literature is um, residential self-selection. So um, studies that look at the impact of uh, dense neighborhoods, for example, on travel find often some relationship, although it isn't as strong as many expect. But is this because it alters the way people travel? Or is it because these neighborhoods attract a certain kind of people who have certain travel preferences, who like to live in um, public, uh, in walkable neighborhoods who like to use public transport. So there is a question of causality um, as well, which makes it hugely complicated um, to um, um, study the impact of the urban environment. But from a planning point of view, there is a consensus that a certain level of compactness simply makes everything easier, more accessible, um, and therefore has the potential to reduce energy demand. I think maybe if I can say one more thing, sure. to me that has that kind of compactness has to come with a, a strong agenda of mixed income housing. Um, so in areas where you, in a lot of cities, you have um, the urban poor living on the fringes of the city and have very long commuting times. And for example, if yeah we were to ban, um, if we had to only walk, most of those people wouldn't be able to get to the economic. The, the space of economic opportunity and income creation. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, affordable housing is um, a very important component of many of those interventions of transit oriented development and densification. Um, it isn't very successful, um, often because the definition of affordability um, is stretched in practice um, quite a lot. Um, and um, social mixing in neighborhoods um, is, um, well, not often that successful because households, usually middle class households, um, uh, tend to um, um, not like social mixing too much, to put it very carefully. Um, and um, so there have, been, there have been issues around that in which then, you know, ex affordability requirements have been relaxed uh, quite a great deal. Yeah, it's an absolutely important component of those interventions. It also has to do, I think, with sort of who is who is building. I mean, we uh, we had this in example in in the introduction video to this course uh, of this area in Bergen, and uh, the municipality for that area had quite uh, you know ambitions for you know for for mixed housing, low income housing, etc. But then 
the building ideology is that this municipality sets aside some land and give and basically sort of sells it to to the private developers and then gives some constraints on what they can do, but not very strict. So you end up with developers building very small, very expensive apartments, very little green space, and it's only the upper middle class uh, without children <laughs> uh, who, who, who end up living there. And there's no, absolutely no diversity in terms of socioeconomics. So, yeah. so, um, so it's, it's a big gap between sort of what's, what's the ambition of the public sector and then uh, what they manage to, to sort of steer uh, yeah. and, and what, the end, what the end result is. And this relates to urban governance paradigms as well. So what we're seeing is what's been characterized as um, entrepreneurial urbanism in which um, cities, um, particularly in the global north, are in competition with each other and need to attract and want to attract, of course, investment and capital um, and therefore um, leave a great deal to the market, but also react to you know, popular um, you know, demands, certain housing typologies, but also you know, um, uh, put limits on, on social mixing for that, for that matter. What do you say, Sid? So should we have a break? And then before we go back to the workshop? Yes, let's take 10 minutes and uh, resume at uh, 